Hey everybody, this is Brooklyn uh, with Recovery Roundtable. Today is August 1st, 2022. And um, tonight we have a special guest. Um, hold on here. Just trying to um, add her in first. But... Hey, Wilma. Hi, Selena. So I am, let me see here. Do, 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 do. I feel like for some reason, this is not giving me the option again. Oh, here we go. So let's see. I will, just waiting for our guest. So, um, Last week we did not have a recovery round table. Um, there was just kind of a lot going on and so I had to focus some attention on um, some other things. So um, it's life, right guys? So um, let's see here. Um, it's crazy because I have to be on my phone for all these episodes. Hey Norma. Um, and I can't text while I'm on the live, and so I have to go on and message that way if I need to get a hold of somebody. So I'm hoping that um, Carrie will get on. Um, and once she's on, I'll let her introduce herself a little more. Um, and let's see, she says she's on. And. Hey, Yuri. Let's see. Just gotta wait for her to pop on. Anyways, let's see here. Sorry, again, we're just kind of working out some kinks, um, but it's good. This is, uh, say hello, this is Millie. This is my grandbaby kitty, my grandbaby kitty, say hello. Uh, it's my daughter's kitty that she just brought home one day and just, I was trying to act like I wasn't mad or that I was mad, but I really wasn't because I actually was contemplating getting a kitty <laughs> at that time. So, um, it's just funny how that, that all worked out. But she likes to walk all over my keyboard for some reason. Um, and uh, walk in front of the screen and all of that good stuff. So you might see her kind of walking around in the background or in front of the camera. She's just curious, she's just a little baby. So um, let's see, let's see. Oh, you know what? Okay. Um, uh, whenever I do these live shows, the other person also has to be on their phone. So for some reason, Facebook doesn't allow um, these uh, lives with another person unless you're both on a phone and it won't let you do it over the computer. So it's kind of pain in the butt. Um, but um, that's what it is. Uh, I'll just remind her here. I'm sure she can see. Let's see. So, what was last weekend? Last weekend was... Hey, Melody. Good to see you. I'm glad that you are on today as well as everybody else. Um, okay. So, let's do a recap. Yes, not yesterday. Not yesterday. Um... Over the last weekend, so weekend of uh, July 22nd and 23rd, 24th, um, hey, there's Carrie. Okay, I'm going to bring her on, and then I'll finish with the update. But, um, that weekend, weekend was uh, my home community uh, celebration powwow, uh, running antelope. Hey, Carrie. 
Hi. I'm just giving a quick update and then I'm going to let you introduce yourself, okay? Sounds good. Thanks awesome. for okay. Um, so um, it was really cool because we had the opportunity, uh, and when I say we, uh, myself and um, my other team members from the uh, treatment program um, with Standing Rock, uh, the Youth and Families, Youth and Family Tree Program, and then the Tribal Opiate Program, um, we had the opportunity to set up a booth um, at the Powell and uh, distribute Narcan, and then also um, just inform our community um, about the the rising numbers of opiate use and um, and overdoses. So um, we had that opportunity. It was really cool. Um, we got to hand out a lot of information, and then we had little door prizes. Um, you know, for whoever participated, they get to spin this wheel, and so uh, they have a chance to win some door prizes. So that was kind of cool. Um, and everybody that came to our table, as long as they were 18 or older, they came with a parent. Um, they were given. A Narcan and shown how to use that. Um, and we did explain, you know, just because you have Narcan in your home or in your office or, you know, just with you in your purse, your bag, whatever, um, it doesn't mean that somebody in your house is using or that you're using or, you know, because I feel like there's that kind of stigma around that, you know, and so we want people to be as comfortable as possible and know how to uh, use um the narcan in case of an emergency so we wanted to kind of educate on that too but it was really great like we had i don't know at least over 100 people come to our booth you know adults um elderly and kids and so it was really cool they all got to learn some stuff win some prizes and um we plan on doing the same uh this coming weekend for a long soldier celebration in fort yates um and so it should be fun and then on top of that, um, I do have uh, my own consulting um, LLC. And so um, because we're funded on a grant, it's hard to purchase certain items or like to, um, I don't know, utilize the funds. We have to be careful how we utilize our funds. So with my consulting program, I actually was able to donate some gift baskets full of some good stuff. And then... Um, so, and then uh, some kids things. So I um, put together um, two baskets for a uh, Kahomini and a rabbit dance. So we had a cool little special um, with a Kahomini and rabbit dance and it was for anybody, you know, anybody that wanted to come out with their partner, whoever, and uh, you know, just dance and it was fun. And so we got to, uh, we gifted one basket. So I was originally, I was gonna do um, both baskets for the one winner, you know, the one uh, couple winner. So, but we recognized uh, an elderly couple that was out there and they were so cute. And I heard from one of the ladies um, that was judging, she said, that woman, she's always trying to get her husband out there to dance with her and he doesn't go nowhere and she got him out there to dance. So I just thought that was really cool that, you know, they went out there and they danced both songs and they did it right obviously they knew you know and so I really wanted to recognize them for that and so we gave them one of the gift, gift baskets you know and then we um we chose a, a, a winner for the other and uh we also you know shared with with the audience that you know we wanted to recognize them because we want our young people to know these ways you know not just not just you know like powwow stuff but we want people to know like all the other little things in between and so it was it was fun and then um and then we put on a tiny tot special um and we had um the winners were four boys and four girls and um there were backpacks there was little basketball goals and then there was some snacks and books and all kinds of stuff and so um we wanted to invite all of the tiny tots out there you know whether or not they had regalia it didn't matter you know we wanted to give everybody um that chance to participate because we all know like nowadays regalia is expensive and if your parents you know or grandmas aunties whoever don't know how to sew or don't you know have the means to put it together it's expensive to have somebody else do it for you so we really just wanted to give every 
every little kid the opportunity. And so there was, I don't even know how many little kids are, that were out there, but they were so cute and they just danced their little hearts out. And so um, I did post some pictures, I wanna say on, on our page. Ooh, I don't wanna say that and then I did it. Um, yeah, I did. And then there's a couple little videos, so it's kind of cute. But um, yeah, it was really good. It was a good turnout. Um, the powwow was actually a lot bigger this year uh, than um, I uh, had expected. So that was really great. Um, there was a bunch of other really good specials. There was a lot of, excuse me, there was a lot of um, men's traditional specials, which I love watching. Um, and then I think there was a, a jingle special in a an old style fancy shawl, I think. So there was some cool stuff. Um, but we're hoping to do the same thing next year and, um, you know, just kind of make it fun. So, um, and then with that, you know, just presenting our information, you know, who we are, where we are. Um, we want people in our communities to know where we're at and how to reach out to us. And so, um, so yeah, that's my little update. Um, I like to do that, you know, because um, I just want people to know, you know, what's going on in our communities and, you know, if there's ever any time somebody wants to volunteer, help out, let me know. Or if you, if you have some ideas, you know, have more ideas of what more we could do, I'm all ears. So with that, I um, would like to have Miss Carrie introduce herself. And I'm so thankful that you're here today. Thank you very, very much. Oh, so. thank, you. thank you for having me. One second, I'm going to turn the light on in here. Yeah. Seeing uh, nothing but my reflection of the screen on my glasses. So it's like, oh, no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, Brother Brandon uh, gave me your number and was like, you need to reach out to her and see if she needs, uh, she needs a guest tonight. And I was like, yeah. Sure. Um, I... I don't even know where to start. Like I called my kids right before this and I was like, Hey, I'm going to be sharing on this, you know, this tribal, op 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 I can't even say opioid. Yeah. I can't say the drug, but I did the drug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I, I can't, um, I was, I was a little nervous cause like I haven't shared much of my story. Um, especially with people from back home and I absolutely mm -hmm. love Sandy. And there was a time, so I have to say early in my recovery where <clears throat> I thought that, I didn't want anything to do with my own people. And I'm not proud to say that, but that was where my mindset was at that time. But um, let's get to it. Like, I grew up in, I was born in 48, grew up in Cannonball for a few years. My father relocated due to work down to 48. And we were there for the majority of like our elementary and high school years. And, um, you know, like, like most homes back, or like most homes, there is some dysfunction, right? There's some things that happen that people just don't talk about, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, my home was no different. The home I grew up in was no different. You know, I had one brother and one sister. Um, my father was a full-blood native. My mother was full-blood not native, you know, so she was, I was a mixed race too. And um, for a long time, I thought that was the reason why I felt the way that I felt inside. I kind of always kind of felt like I'm here and I, this is my family, but why don't I look like the rest of my family, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I, I get so distracted by the chat. I'll be saying hi to every single person that pops up. <laughs> but yeah, like, so I grew up uh, primarily in Fort Yates in my, you know, adolescent and uh, teenage years. Went to school at Standing Rock. I was a pretty good student. Um, right up until I discovered alcohol, you know, and alcohol had been you know, it wasn't a constant presence in our lives, but because my dad was a cop, so it was like, we'd see it and we were always told, you know, alcohol is bad, nothing good comes from alcohol, don't ever drink, you know, whatever. Drugs weren't even on, in the picture at that time, it was just booze. And at the age of 16, I drank root beer schnapps. I, you know, got in trouble for it and stuff. And I remember thinking right after that, you know, normally if you're a good kid, you get in trouble, you don't want to get in trouble again, right? Um, I couldn't wait to drink again. And I didn't know what that feeling was. I just remember thinking like, that, I like that. I want more of that, right? Um, obviously, as a, as a teenager, can't really get your hands on any booze. Um, I remember one time there was a guy that uh, used to hang around in Solon. His name was Jake White Eagle. 
and um, they used to call him Shaky Jake, and I would, would try to get him to go get me booze and be like, no way, I know your family, you know? And, uh, you know, so it was like, that was out of, out of the cards. And then round about 18, um, I left a home that I grew up in, and I was living on my own, basically. I was in foster care here and there, but uh, for the most part, I was just running wild. And I started drinking, and I didn't put down the drink until I got pregnant with my daughter. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm going to do this perfectly, you know. I couldn't wait to have her. Like, I couldn't wait to be a mom. And she's 29 years old now, and it's like I still think she's my little baby, you know. Um, but I wanted so badly to, to be like, like that perfect mom you see on TV, right? Like, you know, like the girl, the, the, mo the kids next door and the mom's perfect. And she goes to work every day. She's there for all the P PTA stuff, all that. And, um, my kids didn't get that. I have two other boys too. Um, I have a daughter named Charlie, a son named Davis, and then a son named Ty. And Charlie and Davis were with me majority of their lives. Um, until they got into high school and then I sent them to live with other people or they chose to actually and I didn't fight them you know because it was by that point I was so heavy into pills um, I had hurt my back like in 2003 hurt my knee around the same time and I got addicted to Darva sets really quickly um, I would go in IHS emergency room I go to Bismarck emergency room I go anywhere I could to get to get this med sorry about that I'm sure silence that and then um, when they moved out, um, I started using meth. And meth was like how alcohol was in the beginning. It was my friend in, in the beginning. And it was the thing that uh, made me realize, made me think to myself, like, life isn't so bad, you know? Because what I didn't know at that time was that I had this disease called alcoholism and addiction that basically every single time I didn't have a substance in my body, I couldn't wait to get it in my body again, right? Like, cause me and of myself, I always had this feeling of lesser than, different, um, uh, just didn't belong kind of thing. And it wasn't coming from the outside. You know, my family told me they loved me. I had aunties and uncles that doted on me. I had, I mean, I was very, very fortunate growing up. I had a mother that would do anything to make sure I had what I needed, you know? Um, and yet, I still would sit there and tell people, you don't get it, you don't understand. You know, you don't get it, you don't understand. And I couldn't figure out then what it was, but looking back on it now, that was active alcoholism all over it. That was all the parts of being an alcoholic to the physical, the mental, the spiritual. Um, so my kids, like they said, they moved on. I, I went, I started getting hooked up with meth. And I always remember thinking before I ever tried meth, before I even tried marijuana, like, okay, I do pills and I drink from time to time, but I don't do that hard stuff, right? Um, mm. I, I, smoke, I smoke weed. Okay, now I smoke a little weed, but I don't do all that other stuff. I'm not into meth and all that. Started doing meth. Okay, well, I'm not doing heroin, right? At the end, I was doing everything, everything. You know, smoking fentanyl patches, um, snorting anything I could get my hands on, anything that would crush. I remember uh, buying, um, at one point, purchasing, uh, what do you call them, behavior meds, um, like ADHD medication from somebody and snorting that. And that was a process. Like you had to like peel off the extended release stuff. And <laughs> it was a very intricate process. And I remember thinking like all the time, even then, like all of this time I, I'm spending, you know, like getting drugs and finding drugs and, you know, like, all of this effort and yet just hanging out with people that are like that love me was painful mm -hmm. i couldn't figure out why that was and then um you know i was in a couple of abusive relation well one seriously abusive relationship and it wasn't like it was one way you know i was just as mean and i was just as ornery and um I had my periods of where I'm going to do different now, you know, I'm going to do better. I'm not going to keep doing this to myself and my kids because um, I love my kids more than anything. You know, um, my youngest son, uh, he just notified me that he's on here right now. And um, I remember he was about three years old and I gave, I basically signed over custody of him to his dad and his grandma. You know, And at the time it was because 
because, well, financially I couldn't afford to. But looking back on it, I know it was because I didn't want to screw him up the way I was screwed up, right? Mm -hmm. My older two have been through a lot. So then after meth came in the picture, it was just downhill. Um, I was smoking it, but I'm not snorting it. I'm not shooting it. Well, now guess what? I'm snorting it too now. Now I'm shooting it now. Um, I'm, I'm doing all the things I said I wouldn't do. I'm ending up in places I said I wouldn't go. Um, I leave the reservation to come to, to move to Bismarck Mandan and try to get sober in 2014, staying with family, not even in a place of my own. And I last about two weeks. And then there, there's a saying in recovery, it says water seeks its own level. And you always find the people that do what you do, right? And I did, I found the people that did what I did. Um, so I, I went down that road. I, I, I've made, so I've caused so much harm, like within my family that I thought that there was just no way that I could ever stop doing what I'm doing because every time I got sober, all I could think about was how I hurt my family, how mm -hmm. I stole this or took that or caused my mom to st stay up like hours and hours and hours like she was a her career basically was working at the casino she worked in their cash desk for a, for a very long time and she retired from there and she would be up at 5 a.m to be at work by seven and she's up till three checking on me because she sees me active on facebook like that's a parent shouldn't have to do that right um, so 2014, I get another relationship. I try to stay sober because it's the guy, the guy's going to make it better. He's a sweetheart and he treats me good and everything's going to change now. And a few months in back at it again, and I can't stay away from it. And I couldn't figure out why, if I know what's going to happen here, if I take this drink, if I take this drug, if I hang out with these people, I'm going to keep doing this thing again, but yet. I always, something always took me back to the first drink or use, whether it was, I would have an excuse, right? Um, oh, so-and-so got mad at me. I got mad at so-and-so. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't get my way or they got their way and they didn't even think about me or whatever it may be, just chock full of resentment. All these, all these things that I thought were the reasons why I drank and used, I find out in recovery in 2018. Oh, actually, no, 2017 was when um, let me back it up just a little bit. So in 2016, I got an apartment in, in Mandan. It was right by the jail. Um, that it's called Burby apartment buildings. And I remember my, my window faced out at the jail at Morton County jail. And I would watch people come out of jail and be like, Oh, I bet you they know where to find whatever. And I go run downstairs and I'd be like, Oh, you don't have place to stay. Come stay with me out of the kindness of my heart. You know what I mean? And yet all it was, it was all with ulterior motives to get what I wanted. And I would have told you I was a good person. I, I would have told you that um, my intentions were, were good, that I wasn't out to try to get something from someone. You know? um, I've had very few friendships throughout the years last because of the way I behaved and the things that I did while I drank and used. Um, I, I got distracted again. Hi, Bam. <laughs> <laughs> but so, <clears throat> so I'm there and I get evicted from this place. Actually, before I got evicted, one of my friends, her name was Carla Yellowbird. She was mis reported missing in July of 2016 and her body was found in August of 2017. And it was a result of the lifestyle we were living. And I remember then thinking, okay, this is it now. This is my wake up call. I'm going to stop now. Couldn't even, I didn't even last a week, you know? I went and I had a few beers with some friends thinking the drugs were the problem and I was back at it again. Because what I didn't know then, what I know now is that once I start, I don't stop, you know? And it's not like, I would have every intention, like I'm gonna take $20 with me, that's it. I'm not gonna spend any more money. And it, I'd blow my whole check and then I can't pay my rent. And then I'm you know, borrowing money from my kids. Like, yeah. it's just the insanity of it just blew my mind. And then, so I get evicted from that apartment after, shortly after my friend was found dead. Um, this was around the same time as Dapple. Um, I was basically befriending men. So that way I'd have a place to live, place to stay. And right around December or November, 2017, 
I remember saying to my sister and my mom that I needed to get sober. I don't want to do this anymore. And I, I was one of the times that I had seen my nephew, my youngest, uh, my sister's little boy, his name is Vincenzo. And he was just little yet. And I remember sitting on the floor playing with him. And I remember saying to him, like, I'm, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore. And I was just held him for a long time. So I filled out this application to Hope Manor at some point when I was, when I was high or drunk. I don't remember filling it out. I get a call from the lady. She's like, I'll meet you over here at this time. And I said, okay, I'll meet you there. Call her the next day. I can't make it because I'm coming down. You know, I got, I'm dope sick. Mm -hmm. And um, like, okay, I'll give you one more chance. If you're at this place at this time, I'll see you. So I met with, met with her at Little Duke's uh, Deli, their little eatery area. And I remember I got there and I had so much paraphernalia in my bag. And I took it in little empty shooters that I thought maybe I could get the corners out of, you know, whatever. And um, I went in the bathroom and I disposed of all of that, got rid of everything that was possibly drug or alcohol related. And I remember sitting out at the table and she came in, her name was Megan. And she said to me, I, I started giving her the spiel, right? Like, well, this happened when I was a kid and my uncle died and my cousin died. And, you know, like, cause there's a lot of deaths, you know, back home there is, there's a lot of suicides. A lot of overdoses, a lot of DUI related things. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like all these things, all these reasons. And she looks at me and she goes, Can I cuss a little bit? Can I say the S word? Okay. She said, You look like shit dying. What are you gonna do about it? And I remember being just heartbroken because I thought I looked cute. Okay. You see pictures of during that time, I weighed probably about 60, 70 pounds less than I weigh now. My hair was falling out, my skin was yellowish gray. I looked like I looked like I was dying. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, I looked at her and I said, I'll do whatever it takes. And so she talked to my mom on the phone. My mom, of course, was still trying to, was trying to save me, right? Um, she paid for one more thing. She paid my, my uh, deposit for my stay at Hope Manor for the first two weeks while I was supposed to go to jail. I ended up take, I had every intention of going to jail and turning myself in because at this point I had like four or five warrants on my, on my record. Mm -hmm. um, DUS is a uh, failure to appear. Um, what do you call it? When you don't register your vehicle, all that kind of thing. Nothing drug related at this point. And my mom pays for the $250 deposit. I tell the lady, okay, I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna go turn myself in. Um, I tried asking her for a ride because it was winter time in North Dakota. And I, she's like, you got yourself here. You can get yourself there. <laughs> she walked away. <laughs> Yeah. You know, holy <laughs> she just wants me to die you know just victimhood victimhood all over it so then i um I, I start walking towards the jail and then i get a call and it's the dealer and i'm like okay i can't go to jail sober i can't go to jail without anything i gotta go get something so i tell him i'm on my way i'm not even 50 feet from his house my phone starts ringing don't recognize the number. Then I see his number come up. And you know how you see people crack phones? Okay, mine was cracked beyond, like, every time I would swipe or anything, I'd get slippers of glass. And I'm trying to get his number, you know, and I end up accepting her number. And she says, if you're back where I met you at 1.30 today, I'll take you today. And I don't know what made me decide to go back there, but I did. Wow. And I I went back to uh, Little Dukes, waited for her. She came and got me. I went to Hope Manor. I was introduced to the Ruins of Recovery. I saw a lot of people from back home there. You know, I saw like Margo and Jenna, and there's a couple other people that were there that I remember thinking like, okay, maybe, maybe, you know, because they looked healthy, they looked happy, they look, they look good, you know. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, <laughs> and then um. I stayed there for a few months and around month four, I started getting this notion in my mind that, well, I know of, I know enough now I'm going to go, you know, I think I'm ready for the world. Now. I had no home. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, I only had a job I've only had for about a month at that point, but yet I had it all together. Right. I had left and I had every intention of staying sober, every intention of going to meetings the way that they taught me to, but I ended up going back out. I had one drink and I ended up stranded down in Rapid City, South Dakota, outside, outside a gas station called Common Sense. 
thinking to myself, like, I don't have none of that. <laughs> like, <laughs> look where I'm at again, you know? Yeah. So I called my mom and she was able to get me a ride back up to North Dakota. And I remember um, sitting in, in a, it's, they call it ACS. It's like adult alternative services care for people that are trying to stabilize on their medication. It's not a detox center, but sometimes people go there while they're trying to withdraw from the meds before they get stable. And yeah. I went there and I spent about four days detoxing. And then um, I started filling out applications to sober living homes. I filled out like six of them. And I remember the whole time telling myself, I'm not going back to Hope Manor. They're too strict. I'm not going back to Hope Manor. It's too hard there, you know, or they're mean, they're racist. I had every reason going through my mind. They weren't none of those things, you know, they just hold you accountable. They, mm -hmm. you say you're going to do something, you do it. If you say you're not going to do something, don't do that, you know? But I, I was, I, the dishonesty that I had was so ridiculous, right? So then uh, I go back June 25th, 2018 with sobriety, clean date. Um, I was actually sober prior to that, but that was the day where, when I walked back through the doors, I told myself that no matter what, I was going to do everything they asked me to do, show up the way they asked me to show up, and I did. You know, I started going to meetings regularly. I started doing the steps like, like, like authentically, you know, like, like, like my life depended on it because I knew it did. So I did, I did all the stuff and I stayed, I ended up being there for about a year or so. And then I got, for some reason, I felt like I wanted to help. I want to be of service. So I started managing. I was their assistant manager for a little over a year, almost a year and a half. And then in June, on June 2021 yeah 2021 i moved out had a place on my own had a car had my license back no warrants um i served i did 364 days of uh, unsupervised probation for a check fraud um and i i paid the fines that came with it um and during this whole process the last four years i spent a lot of time making amends to people that i had harmed um in November of 2021, I got a call that the lady that was running the sanctuary, she was one of my mentors at Hope Matter. Her name was Carolyn Ng. She passed away suddenly, very, very suddenly. And there was, uh, there was a possibility that this home would shut down. And I had always wanted to take what I had learned at Hope Matter and through recovery programs in Bismarck. I wanted to take that home. And I, and, and I was dead set on it. I was like, I'm going to write a grant, all these things. And I remember every time I would approach the subject with people that were, that have been doing sober living, the two things that kept popping up was that you have to have some form of economic development, like job jobs in the area, and you have to have a network of recovery going. And at that time, which was 2020, 21, it didn't, it didn't appear to me, and I could be completely wrong because I haven't been home in a while, but it just didn't seem like there were those two things in place at that time, you know? I think that's changing, and look at what you got going on now, you know? Yeah. And I remember when they approached me with coming up, moving into Minot and running the home, I remember thinking very clearly, like, this is what comes next until I can do the next thing, until I can help more people. And I actually get the opportunity to help a lot of Native women in this area, um, not only from MHA and uh, Spirit Lake and Belcourt, but also from Standing Rock. We have a gal that's going to be moving out soon that has completed the program. And I don't know, man, like this journey has been such a trip. Like if you would have told me five years ago, I'd be doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> I would have laughed and been like, yeah, right. You know? <laughs> Not because I didn't want to, but because I just didn't think it was possible. Because I was deep into that life. I, it was the only thing that mattered to me was getting high or, or getting wasted or finding some kind of relief in that sense. And um, what the programs of recovery have taught me is that I can seek relief in something healthy too. You know, I can, uh, I can give back to the community. I can, you know, do the work as far as your your our twelve step work and stuff. I get to work with other women, knee to knee, sitting with them while they're sharing things that uh, they wouldn't normally share with others, you know? And I get to share with them what's, been, what's going on in my life. I don't know. I have a lot of awesome um, experiences since coming into recovery. You know, like I said, I got my license back. I'm like legit now. <laughs> <laughs>
That's good. I was without one for eight years, like eight years. Um, the last time I, the, what do you call it? The, when I first went to Home Manor, it was because I had gotten kicked out of the car I was staying in. I wasn't even living in a house at that point, you know? And uh, I, just, I just hope that if there's someone on here or some, someone that knows someone that's going through something similar, that there is hope. You know, there's, a, there's, there's so much out there as far as people that want to help. Um, just gotta, just gotta try, you know, like, and I didn't think, cause I was like $75,000 in debt when I got sober and wow. or near done, but I, I, I'm over the halfway mark. And to be able to look at it that way, as far as like that, it's only been a few years and you know, it, it's just crazy. And like a brother Brandon, man, like he talks about Hope Manor. I, that's where I met him, you know, and he's my, he's legit my brother now, you know, <laughs> like. I never knew what it meant to be friends with the man before, you know, and to be able to be friends with men today, it's pretty cool, you know, and you who got him. Huh? I said, you who got him. Yes. He's one of us. <laughs> <laughs> we take him. No, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and then not only that, but like all the women that I've met through recovery, um, I don't have to compete anymore and compare mm -hmm. myself to them and judge each other, judge everybody. Um, I can just be, you know, and that's pretty cool, you know, to not feel like, um, like I got to worry about the cops when they drive by. Um, mm -hmm. Like if the cops get called to a situation, I just give my, my <laughs> testimony and go about my day. I'm not sitting there thinking about all the ways I need to avoid the cops, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I think that's, it. well, I, got, I do have to share one thing. Um, my daughter, well, my kids, I'm proud of all of them. They're all doing really good. Um, the way that I was living, they could have gone down some really destructive paths, you know. Um, but all three of them are doing really well, and they're flourishing in their lives. And um, I wouldn't even be here to enjoy it if it wasn't for recovery, you know. Um, I was able to join my daughter's father as we walked her down the aisle a couple months ago, or a month and a half ago. And um, there was a time she couldn't stand me, man. Like, she was sick of me. And um, she even went to college halfway across the country, so she didn't have to deal with me, you know. Mm. And um, I don't think it was meant like that, but that's the way I took it. <laughs> but um, other than that, I don't know what else to share. You know, if anybody's got I don't any know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I know who your sons are, but I do know who your daughter is, and she has a beautiful voice. Oh my God, she is. She's a beautiful singer. And I wish, I remember, I don't know if she still does this, but I remember a long time ago, she had like videos that she would, she'd be like on her guitar and singing. And I, I if she's watching, I really wish that she would do that again because she has a really beautiful voice. Yeah. So. She actually just moved up to Minneapolis. She started a new job at a theater company out there. It's following her dream, you know, and, um, you know, Davis, Davis works down on Standing Rock at IHS. And uh, he does like hunting the rock videos with my brother. Uh -huh. And then um, Ty, he's out in Fargo. He's uh, selling cars out there at Corwin. I'm going to give a plug. Corwin Chrysler in Fargo. Go see Ty Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> Not a sponsor yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know what? I. I just really appreciate your story. And actually, I know that I had met you a long time ago. It was oh, before I had my daughter, which had to have been like, oh, I don't know, 2000, gee, 2000, 2002, one, somewhere around there. I remember uh, I got to meet Carrie a long time ago during softball, my older, one of my older sisters. Mm -hmm. had a softball team and that's where I met Carrie long time ago and so it just it's nice to just reconnect with people and get to know people again and that's that's what I really like about like like this and coming back home you know I was in Arizona for a long time and and worked down there and then I worked with MHA um, remotely and then came back and then worked here and just that time and distance you know it, it does distance people in relationships and I always felt kind of bad too because um like I didn't I didn't hear like the language I didn't hear the songs I didn't see the same people you know and so being away from home is good 
don't get me wrong it's it's good i think it helps us all grow and um but i i'm really glad that i came back because it's it's like something that's like missing there's like a void somewhere in your you know heart or your being your spirit and it's good to some kind of times come back and kind of reabsorb that so i'm glad to be home because i get to see i get to see ra people just randomly like i ran into somebody else uh when was that yesterday and um we were leaving Coles. oh my gosh i thought my little girl was gonna run on the street and this, this other girl that i knew and she said hi and i looked up and i was like hi and i like had to just like you know and i was like oh i kept thinking about it for the rest of the day i was like i hope she doesn't think that i was being rude no, you know no. but it's I just know. i love being able to run into people you're absolutely right about that like there's little something missing kind of thing because like I um like I said early on, like I I thought that back home was the problem, and I know that's not the I know that's not what it was, you know. I'm an alcoholic and an addict, and there's a lot of people, a lot of good people down there that stay sober and they don't have to work. They're they're they lead really productive and lives good lives full of service to the community, and for some reason I I couldn't avoid it, you know, and. I think getting away from it helped, but I can't wait to be able to, I don't know, like I, I started working for Cheryl Carey at Sacred Pipe Resource Center in, I wanna say February, 2020, 2021. And um, I worked for her for a long time and slowly through events with the public and being in the community, the native community, I can just feel my heart getting fuller and fuller, you know, like, Man, this feels good to be amongst natives, you know, and I love everybody like I I have a lot of uh, non native friends that um, that are my family, you know, yeah, and um, and to be able to see it see my see like my family members from back home and just be nothing but love when I see them that feels good because there was a time I would clear a room in seconds flat because I was so I was just so miserable man like like oh five minutes I give Carrie five minutes before she throws a tantrum or throws a fit, you know. <laughs> emotional and today it's like uh, my feelings still get hurt once in a while but it's like uh, the creator's giving me this calm today where I don't have to feel like I have to be perfect and I can be a fool for a creator I can yeah you know, I, can, I can be silly and be honest and not mm -hmm. feel like uh, even if I am being judged so what it's not my business you know <laughs> yeah. I feel like there's a, a there's a difference like once somebody decides i mean to kind of like just give themselves and give their heart give their spirit you know back to creator like it just just opens things up you know and it opens up opportunities it opens up you know like just personally i think your heart to love you know and have real unconditional love you know when maybe you've been hurt in the past or you know or you just don't know how i just think when when we give ourselves to creator it just opens up these different doors for us that we may not have recognized in yeah. the past and so i really appreciate that i'm glad that you also you know have that experience too and and you i, I gotta go back because and so if you see me looking down, I always tell people I'm writing notes because I, I, if I have a question, I want to go be back and ask, you know. So um, you said in recovery, there's a quote that says water, what? I want to write that down. Water seeks its own level. You water know, what? Water seeks its own level. So uh -huh. like around, I guess it's an analogy for you know, if I'm in a place where, uh, let's say, I want to be resentful and angry and miserable, they say misery loves company, I'm going to be around people that are like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are somebody that wants to drink and get high, you're going to find a way, you know. Um, yeah. But today, I I like to think that the, the level I seek today is uh, one surrounded by people that are positive and working working towards a life that's that's that serves other people and serves creator and you know what i mean like yeah. you know um 
I just, there was a time, like I said, I was just a miserable, miserable being. Like I, I love, I love my family and kids, but I couldn't figure out why I was so just unhappy. And uh, I used to think it was depression. I mean, I was prescribed everything like um, OCD, ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, bipolar disorder, manic depression disorder. Mm -hmm. um, at one point they thought it was uh, something uh, borderline personality disorder. And I was on meds for every single one of those things at one point. I think at one point I was taking 17 medications a day. Oh, wow. And then at one point I remember thinking, this isn't normal, this isn't right, you know? And I, I've had countless trips, not countless, four trips, four, four trips to the psych unit. Um, I did have a attempted suicide at one point. I tried to OD on some, uh, some uh, behave, uh, mental health medication and, mm -hmm. um, I just remember coming out of it thinking like, why am I still here? Like, that's how desperate and hopeless I felt at that time. And um, my, my oldest boy, I remember coming to you and he, he was like sitting right by my bed. And he's like, mom, don't do that again. You know, mm -hmm. and I always said I'd never would. Um, but thank God that today I've been given a solution today. You know what I mean? This, I, this, uh, these tools that when I do get long or something's disturbing me or upsetting me. Um, I have people I can call. I have um, the programs of recovery. Um, so that's that's the that's the level I seek today. It's okay. Like I want to be in recovery. I don't want to be doing the thing. And I think for the most, uh, I th what is this to say? It says, uh, if you don't take the first drink or drug, you can't get drunk or high. And I remember, oh. I remember I was watching over when all of a sudden that just blew my mind like oh if I don't do one I don't do any more you know <laughs> okay okay you know but yeah so I don't even know if I answered the question <laughs> oh yeah no yeah you did how about um it's so crazy because you you've like triggered my memory on other things you know that that I've experienced with you know, people that I've worked with in the past or friends or, you know, and it's kind of like, <sighs> I don't even know. Like, I think a lot of times people or families, they think that treatment itself is the answer and it's the fix all. And, you know, I've so many times I've had families, um, you know, come back to me and say, <clears throat> or talk you know, even publicly, you know, at tribal council or wherever. And they say, my so-and-so went to treatment and they're not better. It didn't fix them. It, they're still using, they came back and blah, 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 blah. And so what I hope to help people understand is that no, treatment isn't a miracle worker. Like it's, it's, yeah. It's a place where individuals are able to gain those coping skills, coping mechanisms, and other resources, you know, and then also, you know, the therapeutic um, service as well. And so I always have to explain that to people um, when they say treatment didn't fix my so-and-so. And I'm like, well, it's not going to fix your so-and-so, you know, your so-and-so has to uh, work on it themselves they say that um what is it i've heard too they say that treatment is for discovery like we discover what's going on with us why we do things we do all that sort of thing um the programs of recovery are for or the programs like aa and a um they're for recovery like those are where we start finding new ways to live or new new answers to the problems instead of what worked for us. Because for, for me, for a long time, alcohol and drugs worked for what I needed to needed it to work for. Mm -hmm. Like, I did not feel the way I feel. Here's the fix. I need to, I need to uh, forget what I did. Here's the fix, right? Um, but now today, you know, I, I, when I'm with things that me, if I, if I don't want to feel the way I'm feeling, um, what I've been taught is I always go, we always go and we find someone to help, you know, instead of sitting there thinking me and my, all my problems, you know, I remember <laughs> my, my sponsor early in recovery, I would call her with issues, whatever it was, the guy, the problem, whatever it is. And she'd be like, okay, well, go help somebody else out. 
find, find a way to be of service. I'm like, why am I helping them out? I'm the one with the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Help me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, but I, what I find is when, as I've learned about recovery and as I am of service to other women, other people, I'm not, uh, I'm not thinking about my problems and somehow the, the answer comes eventually, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, they are, one second, sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. Yep, thank you. <laughs> Have you ever experienced, so actually I wrote that down because I like the way that that's termed and I think it's, it's, it holds truth, you know? Um, and so I know, so I've experienced this when working with, with people is that once they get to a certain point and they they're into the recovery uh step um of you know and then being of service to others what mm -hmm. i've noticed a lot of times is that people are so eager to give back and help 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 and then what happens is they just become emotionally and physically drained and then sometimes relapse occurs and so i don't know can you tell yeah. us about that i guess i i um so one thing that i had to learn through this whole process not had to learn got to learn through this whole process is that um there's got to be a certain amount of boundaries in place mm -hmm. like okay if i'm running 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 going 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 chances are i'm trying to avoid thinking about whatever it is that's troubling me um, so I, I, I have other tools to use, like I with periodically. Uh, if I start to feel some old hurt come back up again, I address it within the steps. Because um, we got mm -hmm. steps, you know, there's different things you can do. Like the, they say inventory is a big part of recovery, like inventorying your actions or what's going on inside you, not just what's happening out here, but how does it make me feel inside? And what I found is that when I'm running, 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 trying to help everybody like I went through a period of where I was so excited to have recovery and to be sober and to not be consumed with like this idea of drinking and using or bad decisions basically um I would I threw myself into service and I burnt out mm -hmm. I burnt out and I was lucky because I burnt out in a situation where we had to be sober I was living in Holt Manor at that time and I remember the ladies that I was surrounded with, they were brave enough to come and be like, hey, we see this and we're concerned, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what's important is, one, you got to set boundaries early on. Like, you know your limits. You know your limits as a human being. Like, you, you, you know that when you get to a certain point that if you start running so much, you're going to get so tired that you're not going to have the energy. Guess what? Oh, a little mess will pick me right up, you know? don't want to do that you want to you want to stay in the middle of recovery so that way the people that you surround yourself with can kind of give you a heads up hey something seems off you know so if there's something going on you know you want to talk about it whatever it is right um yeah. so i think that that's helped me um moving up here to minot and doing the job that it well it's not a job it's a service commitment and um there's there's some days where from the moment i get up to the moment my head hits the pillow it's, you know, things to do for the house. It's making sure we, you know, have the funding, right? We have, um, we have the beds, like there, there's beds empty. How are we doing outreach to get more people, more women interested, you know, whatever it may be. Everything yeah. from that, bills getting paid, whatever. And I hit a wall probably about two weeks ago where I couldn't even lift my head. Like, mm. and so it happens. I think what's important is to have those boundaries respect those boundaries not only for yourself but for other people like mm -hmm. if i'm if um somebody's coming to you constantly like hey i need a ride here right there right here once in a while yeah but like if they're constantly doing it you know i'm not teaching you anything by doing this for you over and over again uh, you know? i like what Aiken said yeah <laughs> you at the beginning yeah you know <laughs> you gotta do it you know and um what's that's what that's one thing that's really cool too it's like coming into recovery i would have told you i was smart and at one point i had a very high iq and i think doing a lot of drugs and stuff has diminished that result like greatly <laughs> but it's also led me to this belief that i'm teachable today right yeah. like 
um, and my mind's open to the idea of something different, something, something new, you know. Um, I didn't really, I forgot to share this, but um, early, like when I was about nine years old, <clears throat> I was always kind of seeking something, right? Like, I remember riding bike, going around to Eva's self-service in, in, uh, in Fort Yates. I think it, it was Clayton's when I moved, moved away from there. And um, I was riding bike and I heard church music. But I went into that, that, that self-service or that gas station, got my little penny candies, came out, was eating my penny candy. And I heard like uh, piano music and church music, whatever, and I followed it. And I went, ended up walking into that little church that was right across the street from Eva's way back in the day. And um, my fourth grade teacher was playing piano. And I remember sitting down and just feeling good. Mm. And then I put myself in Sunday school at nine years of age. Oh, just cute. <laughs> I just remembered this recently. I was like, I, oh my gosh, like, cause I'm 48 now, you know, that's like, that's a long time ago. And, um, and I remember thinking like, I've always been seeking something more, you know, and I found it in a spiritual solution, you know, and I, I wish that I could just bottle it up and give it to everybody and be like, do this, man. Like you're, you, I enjoy life more today than I ever have before, you know? And, I've had, I've had some trials, you know, there's a time where my daughter hurt her, got hurt really bad. There wasn't, they weren't sure if she was going to be able to walk or if she's going to be able to, you know, do things on her own for a period of time. And she, she came through it. Okay. Um, but that got scary, you know, and my uncle, one of my uncles had a massive stroke and that was really scary. Um, not to mention people we've lost over the years and past those would have been the reasons to go and drink and use you know um but today you know i i can show up for my family i can be a daughter to my mom a mother to my kids um, i have the coolest relationship with my mom today like we we were we had we were very strange for a long time but she was always the one i ran to you know every time i was in trouble i'd mom need a ride or i have five dollars or whatever it is you know and conversation i mean that's a gift alone in recovery so boundaries circle of support um addressing them within within the steps of your program of recovery you know so yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow i really appreciate everything that you shared with us today and um i do want to tell you that and I know that there's a lot of people that are out there, you know, that have asked and are wondering, but, um, you know, our program is uh, working on a plan for sober living back home. And so um, it's, there, no, <laughs> you can cry, it's okay. Um, but, you know, that's something that is, is really big, you know, and um, when I work with MHA, that, uh, that was probably the biggest thing that uh, came about that helped so many of our people, you know, and so many of the people that are still sober today. And so, you know, I, I definitely want to make sure that our people back home also have the same opportunity because, you know, everybody deserves safety, security, and, you know, that chance at life. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm very supportive of sober living. I've seen how it works. I've seen just how it, I don't know, it just, it helps people grow, you know? And so, yes, I'm a very big supporter of that. And it's, um, it is definitely part of the conversations that we are having now. And it's just, you know, getting stuff up off the ground. And so anybody that wants to be involved, if you want to be involved, you know, I definitely would love to welcome you to the table um, because it's, it's a big opportunity, you know, for our people back home. And, and again, everybody deserves that. So um, there's a lot of planning that goes into it, you know, yeah. and so, um, and, and we love to have, you know, other minds come to the table and be there especially people that have experienced it and um you know they they've lived that 
-hmm. you know they live that life and they've been there and so it's not just a bunch of professionals or whatever you know sitting at the table saying well i think this is good this <laughs> way which i think i mean it's important yeah. to have but at the same time we have to have people at the table that have been there themselves yeah. you know and experience these things that's why again like with our recovery roundtable i love having people on this show that share their stories because i know that there's so many people out there not i mean back home you know in other communities all over all over the nation and where wherever else um that they just maybe they're in a pre-contemplation stage you know or they're in contemplation and they're just not sure yet you know and the scary thing is is like you know i've heard from other people saying the scariest thing for me was um you know going through the withdrawals you know but there's services out there for that too you know a medical detox those are available um because i know that that that's scary for a lot of people yeah. and or just taking that first step of like being honest like hey you know i think i have a problem and i'm, I'm thinking about getting help you know just that first step and whenever i have people come and talk and talk to me about things and they they bring that up and i'm just like it makes me so grateful because i'm like man you don't even know how much courage and strength you have for just saying that yeah. because it's big deal you know it's it's not as easy as people want to say it is or like well how come so and so doesn't get sober well they're not ready you know and until somebody is able to even speak that you know out loud then just i don't know we can't force people so My anyways mom, i want to oh, oh, just say one thing um i know that there's a lot of families out there with loved ones that are you know like have have people that keep doing this over and over and over again and and i did this to my family for a long time and i think and i this isn't for everybody but i know it worked for me my mom started saying no to me and she stopped doing the things that i was used to her doing for me you know she let me hit my bottom you know and i don't think i would have stayed here if i didn't hit that you know mm -hmm. um but yeah yeah that's it <laughs> everybody's rock bottom is different it's not going to look the same for everybody you know yeah. um i have to share that um without giving names or anything like that it, yeah. i i have a friend who is um you know in active addiction and it's so hard to watch you know from afar and even on you know on social media or watch the life like deteriorate and literally deteriorate you know in front of your eyes um and then you know knowing when somebody is put in a position where it literally is like a life and death and you just want to be like get it yep. together yeah you're gonna die and it's so so hard to have to know that there's nothing you can do to make that person want to change you can say all of this and that you know do it for your kids do it for your parents do it for this do it for that remember this blah 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 you know and it's not gonna change somebody's mind until they're ready and unfortunately you know i just and i i really don't like to think this way but it like in my gut in my heart i'm like if this person doesn't you know stay where they're supposed to be to get the help that they need both you know medically and and program wise you know i feel like this person isn't going to be with us very much longer you know and and i actually i had seen this person uh in person the other day and I was like, wait a minute, you know, like they're not to be, you know what I mean? And so <laughs> it was random, you know, and I just was like, wow, it was just one of those things when you actually see somebody in person, not just on social media, you know, that you haven't seen for a long time. And you're like, holy cow, mm -hmm. like this is real, this is real and it's life and death and again like until that individual is ready like 
Yeah. It's, you know, and I really do, you know, I don't know if, I don't know that my friend watches my show, but, you know, if they do, you know, letting, I, you know, I want to let them know that I, I love them. I care about them. And, you know, I just, I just, I pray for them every day, you know, so. That's great. Uh, yeah, to any women that are on and they're looking for help or anything, please feel free to give them my number. You know, um, I, I'll, I'll sit and talk about recovery all day long. <laughs> I believe, I believe so wholeheartedly, not only in recovery, but in sober living, because it's a good thing. And I'll be praying for your friend. Um, but I, I don't know how you feel about prayer, but I, I love it. I, um, I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know my, um, I know I got to the, I got to recovery because my family prayed. Like my son even told me that after he, every hunt he'd be saying a prayer for me. And, I, mm. and yeah, so yeah, I thank you. Appreciate that, you know, and just just have to, yeah, keep praying, you know. So with that, actually, I forgot because we just kind of jumped into it. Yeah. Um, I usually say a prayer before, but I was just like, right away, I was just like, oh, where is she? God. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, you know? So um, I think it would, it, it would be good if we, you know, had a closing prayer. Um, and because you're my elder, I'm going to let you say the closing prayer. <laughs> okay. Free talks? Yeah. All right. All right. Thankful, so thankful for all the people that do the work in recovery, all the people that are in the programs that help to help our people. That I just ask that you watch over those that are still out there sick and suffering and those that are still trying to find their way. I pray that you fill their hearts with hope, ability of change and growth. I love you. Hmm. Thank I just, you. I, I just, <laughs> no, you know what? And and that's the other thing too, is that there's no right or wrong way to pray. So if somebody out there is to pray, don't yeah. worry about it. Just okay. it's a conversation with creator and it doesn't matter because creator already knows, you know. Yeah. So I like to remind well, people that Yes, well. thank you so much. And I always end with you know, from my lodge to your lodge. I hope that you all have a good evening and thank you so much. And um, yeah, and good night. I'll Bye. talk to you again. And I'll see you. Oh, I'm gonna use my mouse. <laughs> <laughs> see ya.